So I kind of have a golden opportunity here to talk about something that I've learned the hard way and something that most, most farmers have not learned at all so far. You know, there's a lot of things that farmers are really bad at financially. You know, like for example, I talked in a previous brief lecture about how expensive it is to drive three quarter and one ton trucks everywhere, you know, especially diesels, just to pick up a few things that, you know, like fit in the bed or whatever. And how, how that costs you like four or five times as much per mile is buying, you know, a, a Ford Ranger or, you know, a minivan or something like that. Something that's just cheap and gets the job done. But no, the farmers want to drive their cool big boy trucks around. And, you know, and it costs them like four times as much per mile. And yes, we, if memory serves at least, we broke down the math on that. But anyway, another thing that I've noticed the farmers are really bad at financially is that they seem to place value on just working for the sake of working. And if this was, for example, a land of endless opportunity for honest people, you know, that'd be one thing, but obviously it's not. Obviously it isn't, and obviously it never will be again. And a lot of, and a lot of people who used to do like, you know, homesteading stuff and small farming stuff a hundred years ago, they could get away with being very time inefficient because they had, you know, like 10 kids or 13 kids or whatever. So they didn't actually have to do it all themselves. There, you know, there was enough labor around where they could, where it was worthwhile for them to do things that otherwise wouldn't have been worthwhile, if that makes sense. Well, unfortunately, as we all know, a specific group of people destroyed the Bible family unit. And so now that's no longer the case. And so now, on pretty much any kind of a small farm application, there's just not enough labor to, to do all this stuff, which means you, you just have to be really specific. You, really, you have to be really intentional about what you do and a little strategic about what you don't do. You know, we talked about, I was talking to a guy about this. We saw this guy and he was, he was doing something incredibly stupid. I don't, I don't remember what. I think he was trying to like disc a field or something because he had, he had a crop failure of some sort and uh, it was like way too muddy to be out there. So he's out there burning all this fuel He's out there putting all these hours on his equipment. All he's doing is making a colossal mess that once it dries out, he's going to have to come back to and disc out again and fix. Like he would have been better off if he just waited a couple weeks and, and then just did it once and did it right. And I said to the guy I was talking to about this, you know, we're watching the guy do this. And I said to him, I was like, man, farming just doesn't pay enough to make mistakes like that. And that's really the truth. That's really the truth of the situation. I'll, I'll give you guys a real life example. You know, unfortunately, I kind of had to learn all this stuff the hard way because nobody really taught me much of anything growing up. But at least I did learn this stuff. And now I'm trying to share that with you guys. So I got this implement here that I'm working on. And unsurprisingly, it needs tires. It's, this is one of the uh, straight out of the fence row deals. Uh, it's been sitting for so long that both rims, <laughs> both rims are actually rusted through. Tires are all destroyed. So, so I'm thinking, I was like, you know, I really don't like dicking with used tires. I really don't, because they're not usually worth messing with. Like, you know, we all see them on classified services where they're half the price of brand new ones, but you know, but they're, they have almost no tread and they're like old and stuff. Just not worth messing with. Used tires are only worth messing with if you have them for free, you know, like off something that's just sitting around. Or if you get a real screaming deal, you know, like 10 bucks or 20 bucks at the tire shop for one that, you know, that's, that has, that's newer, but with a lot of highway miles. So it doesn't have much tread, but it's still solid. It's not all old and like rotten and stuff. Okay. In those situations, they can be worthwhile, but I can tell you guys, I generally don't buy used tires. And I'm looking at this and, you know, and this, this implement here is a great example as to why. I have, it, it takes 15 inch, 15 inch rims, right? That's pretty normal for farm stuff. 
Well, I have some extra 15 inch wheels around. Uh, they came with some trailer axles I got. The guy just had a whole pile of extra wheels and stuff, and, and I took the and I took the ones as part of the deal that looked somewhat half decent. All right, so I got these things, and uh, so I'm out here dicking with them, and one sort of comes off the rim, okay, but you know I find out it's got a bunch of weather cracking on it. And the other one, I spend like a solid hour, and I've got the actual proper tool, like the bead breaker, whatever it's called. I spend probably a solid hour dicking with this thing. And, uh, and you know, the bead kind of loosens a little bit, but I'm looking like the tread, even though these things looked fine at a visual inspection, now that I'm actually kind of working on them a little bit, the tread is already starting to separate off the, you know, off the sidewalls or whatever. It's already sort of coming apart. Yeah, I just looked at this and I'm like, yeah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, you know, this is kind of a bonus lesson here. If you're going to fix up equipment like this implement, I bought this implement cheap enough so that, you know, so that I don't have to half-ass things, to put it bluntly. I bought this thing cheap enough so that I can buy whatever it needs, and, you know, and still be into this a reasonable amount of money for what it is. That's really important for stuff like this. But, you know, that's an example. The used tire thing is kind of a great example of what a lot of farmers do. They place value in, in just, like, time spent working. You, you, you really, just to put it bluntly, you can't do that. You have to be strategic, and you have to really decide what's worth working on and what isn't. You know, and the replacement tires for this thing are somehow not even that expensive. They're, like, you know, 80 bucks a side. I only need two of them. So, like, it's not even really that big of a deal. Well, here's the other part of that that now people have to get better about thinking about likewise. You know, the prices on a lot of stuff have gone up substantially. I'm happy that I can even find these tires for that. And, uh, you know, but the price on, you know, a lot of tires on a lot of supplies has gone up substantially. So now there's a whole nother layer. Because, like, let's say that I sat here and just fucked around with these used tires all day, and I did get them on here. And then, well, what if they only last, you know, maybe like three seasons on this thing? Yeah, you know, let's say they only last three seasons. Well, let's say the price of tires, of this kind of tires, goes up like a lot of pickup truck tires have. It's, you know, it goes up by, let's say, another 50% from where it is now. Well, now, whatever negligible amount of money you save by valuing your time at fuck all, Messing with old tires is, you know, now even that's gone because now it's going to cost you a lot more to do this right. You know, and I decided that I wasn't even going to try to find used tires for this thing. Uh, I decided I was going to try to make what I have sitting here work, and if that doesn't work, I'll just buy new ones. But that's kind of another that's kind of another example of basic economic stuff that a lot of farmers are not good at. I see a lot of tires listed, and you know, it's just something about the used tire market. The people involved in it like i'm sure there's some good ones but overall they're ju they're just super dysfunctional and super incompetent like one time i was looking to replace the tires on a different piece of farm equipment and uh and i saw this listing and the guy's like oh i have all these sizes in this and he listed the size i needed so i messaged him and I'm like hey you know how much for you know this size he's like oh i don't know well the listing said you have some you, you have some right oh uh... Like, I can check, and he just never responded. Yeah, I don't have time for dicking around with clowns like that. You know, back in the days when the average family size, you know, back when people actually went forth and multiplied, like Scripture commanded them to, back in those days, you know, if you've got your eight kids or whatever, and you have one who's old enough to drive, you know, it's not that big a deal if you tell them to, you know, just drive to the tire shop, you know, 30 minutes away or whatever and see if they have anything decent. Okay, but you probably don't have that, so you probably have this endless list of things you need to get done. You know, let's say, let's say it's an hour. It takes an which is which could very easily happen. It takes an hour to go see if they even have anything serviceable. Come, you know, what could you accomplish in an actual hour of your time? Well, if you're only saving like 30 or 40 bucks, you know, by the time you have the stupid thing changed and you have the stupid wheel ready to go, if you only save like 30, 40 bucks in doing that, which you probably didn't. It's probably a lot less than that if you value, you know, like the tube and stuff. If you pay them to install it or if you value your time to sit there and dick around with tire irons for 30 minutes. You probably didn't even save that much. But let's say you saved, you know, 30 or 40 bucks before the cost of driving there, which was easily 5 or 10. So now you only saved like 20 or 25 bucks. 
and you didn't get anything else done, and now you have to do this again, you know, in like three years when the used tire disintegrates. You know, this is absolutely not worth dicking with, but I see stuff like this all the time. You know, I constantly see farmers out fucking around. What they're doing is they're just working for the sake of working. They're working as if that's somehow a good thing. And if, you know, if there's gain involved or some like increase to your, to your situation as an outcome, that's one thing. Okay, but just working doesn't equate to an increase in wealth. A lot of people don't understand that. You know, the average family unit in the Western world, now that both parents are off wage slaving all day, in most situations, they're putting out twice the, uh, you know, the labor hours that people did say 50 years ago, but somehow they have even less to show for it. You know, 50, 60 years ago when the Bible family unit was still a thing and, you know, mom stayed home and took care of the kids and so forth. And it was only dad who was off working, you know, in the factory or whatever. They could easily afford one, maybe two cars. They could easily afford not only a working class, but a middle class home, you know, in a decent neighborhood, which we're not even going to touch on that. You know, they could afford good quality food. They could buy like a TV and such. That one turned out to be a mistake long term, but still, you know, they could afford, you know, appliances and nice things for their house and whatnot. Okay, well today, in contrast, you have both parents working. You know, you have twice the labor hours going out from that family unit. And now if they're lucky, they can afford just not to own, but just to rent and not a middle class place like a like a lower working class place. And that's if they're lucky. A lot of them don't even have that. You know, the average age of vehicles on the road only goes up. All right. So our people are working a lot more, but somehow they have a lot less to show for it. Now, that's our kind as a whole. But I can tell you that's farmers like two or three times more than everyone else. I see farmers out there dicking around when soil conditions are not really feasible. I see other people's hay get rained on because they tried to get it up. You know, they tried to push the weather window and it, and it didn't pan out. You know, I see a lot of farmers who just work constantly and they, you know, they're like just running around like a chicken with their head cut off is the old saying, but they're not really accomplishing anything at the end of the day other than having worked. You know, their stuff's not really getting done. They're certainly not better off financially for having done that. You know, I was fortunate in that I, I got some very basic economics classes. It was like pretty much the one useful thing in the public school system at that time. And that's probably not even available anymore. I graduated a good while ago now. But, you know, they taught us pretty openly that you, you really need to plan things out and a lot of jobs just aren't gonna be worth doing. And it's true, like I'll tell you guys for this implement, I'm not going to I'm not going to mention what it is or by what company because if I do people say a bunch of stupid things about how oh, you should have bought the one from because those never break. Blah. Yeah, we're not going to go down that road. For this implement, I need a replacement piece off it. It's a little piece of cast iron. Fits uh fits in the palm of your hand, probably weighs like 4 or 5 pounds, pretty small. Well, there's lots of these implements out there. And uh and I found that that part available online for like about 50 bucks. Stepped in a hole there for about 50 bucks shipped. And some people would look at that and they'd be like, oh, you know, it's way too much money for that. Well, let's do some quick math here. You know, the seller's fees on that platform and the credit card fees and whatnot are probably gonna eat at least five or 10 bucks of that. It's gonna cost him at least 15 bucks to ship that thing here. So he actually has to go out to this thing and like gather up some tools, take it out there. You know, all that for like, you know, by the time he puts a dollar or two towards the tools and like asks to go, you know, ship this thing or whatever and then pays taxes on that, you know, that $50 part that fits in the palm of your hand, he's going to be lucky if he even has 20 bucks of increase when he actually, you know, when that deal's actually done. So it just kind of has to cost that much. I can tell you guys another example of this. Since we're talking about buying and selling stuff, if I have like extra parts or extra pieces of things, I don't even bother listing stuff on like local classifieds type sites anymore, unless it's worth like 100 or 200 bucks, whatever the item is. Because you gotta figure it takes time and energy to actually, you know, like take the pictures and write the description. You're gonna have to deal with a lot of asshats. A lot of clowns, a lot of low ballers, a lot of people who say, well, you know, uh, I'll come out at this time and then they just never fucking show up and you're out there waiting. You know, all that's worth something. 
And unless the item is worth like one or two hundred dollars minimum, it, I, I don't dick with it. I just take the thing and I throw it out or I give it away or I throw it in the scrap bin. You know, life's too short for spending time and energy doing stuff like that and dealing with these clowns, you know, for, for your $30 piece that might ha you might have to bump the listing for four months before someone actually shows up and buys it. You know, a great example of that is this implement. Like I said, it's straight out of the fence row condition. Sometimes I wouldn't be thrilled about that, but this one was actually priced accordingly. I'm talking to the guy who sold me this thing. He's like, man, I had so many people, I had so many people, you know, ask if this is still available. So many people are like, oh, maybe I'll come out at this time. You know, if I can fit around. And he's like, fuck, do you want this thing or not? You know, <laughs> and he told me. <laughs> and we're talking. And he's like, yeah, you're the first guy who actually showed up and bought this thing. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, you know what it's like to deal with these people? I'm like, yeah, actually I do. <laughs> yeah, you know, actually I have. You know, that that's why I don't sell things, you know, unless they're actually worth enough to be worth selling. You know, that's another great example of that. A lot of farmers, a lot of tradesmen are bad about that. They spend all their time trying to deal with these clowns for pocket change when they could be spending that time doing something productive or something that has long-term value. One other thing that I got better about, one other thing that I kind of learned the hard way over recent years, especially talking about farm stuff, is you really can't do it all. And what you really, really can't do is have to come back and like redo things and fix things twice. I think a lot of people who farm would be a lot better off if they would just kind of centralize and professionalize whatever they're doing. You know, I sold a lot of junk equipment that I kind of wanted to fix up, but I was like, realistically, I'm never actually gonna do this. And I don't, I don't regret that at all. I don't miss any of it. I drive past other farms and I see just like a field full of old dead trucks and decomposing tractors and whatnot. You know, they are ne never actually gonna do that. They are never actually gonna fix it up. They are never actually gonna fix that stuff up. It just sits there for year after year after year. You know, they should sell all that stuff and then, and then buy just like one thing that actually works right or one thing that's worth fixing up or maybe one thing that's new. You know, that'd be an increase. And then they wouldn't have all this clutter around. And all these people that say, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this project one day. You know, the cold hard truth is most of them never do. You know, I've told this story before. When I was younger, when I was in high school, there was a friend of mine who wanted to do some kind of like landscaping, contracting sort of business. And he was pretty good with things mechanically. And, uh, and he, he wanted a skid steer, right? So he could start this company. And he's like, man, I'm trying to find a skid steer. You know, it doesn't have to be pretty. You know, I, I, I like, I know how to work on things and so forth. And I thought, I was like, hmm, you know, I actually know where there is one. I know where there's a skid steer on one of the back country roads, one of the farm roads where I grew up. It's sitting in the weeds and it's been that way for like longer than anyone can remember. It's like, yeah, yeah that sounds awesome. So we drive out there one day, find the thing. Yeah, it didn't move obviously, it never moved. Up, oh, spoiler alert. We go knock on the people's door and it's this old boomer. He's like, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm gonna fix that up one day. Wouldn't sell it. Okay, I was visiting home like 12 years later. The fucking thing is still there. It, it's, it's still in that exact same spot. 12 years, just since that interaction, hasn't moved an inch. You know, that's a great example of someone who's never actually gonna work on that stuff and someone who would probably be a lot better off if they made an effort to kind of pick and choose their battles and focus on what's actually profitable. You know, one guy I know said, and this was probably close to 10 years ago now this conversation took place. So what he said is gonna be worth even more with, with inflation and whatnot. He said, you know, I, I realized I was just way too busy. So I decided I'm just not gonna take any uh, tasks that he does unless I'm gonna profit $1,000 off a minimum. He said that was the best decision he ever made for his business. He works a reasonable amount going forward from that point and he's not really making any less money. It's kind of how it is. Yeah, I'll give you a great example of what not to do. When I was a kid in like middle school, I used to raise chickens and sell eggs. I think I've talked about that before. 
It would have been like 2007, 2008. And I remember back then, 50 pound bag of the feed that I bought cost about $7, seven bucks and change. And at the time I was selling eggs for I think $2 a dozen, it might've been 250. Well, I was visiting the area where I grew up a few years ago and I still see signs up for people selling eggs. And uh, I know people with chickens and now that same bag of feed is almost $20. And guess what these people with the chickens still sell the eggs for? $2 or 250. All right, I know that when feed costs less than half of what it does now, I, I, once everything was paid for, I like more or less broke even on those stupid birds. There's a reason why I don't have chickens anymore. Uh, <laughs> once, e I mean, everything was paid for. The coop, you know, maintaining the coop, the, the, you know, the, like the waters and the feeders and whatnot. Once all this stuff was paid for, I more or less broke even. And now the profitability of that is like a third what it used to be. And people still do it. I can tell you from my limited experience with chickens, you'd really have to sell eggs for like, like six or seven bucks a dozen just to be at the same level of profitability that selling them for 250 a dozen brought in 2007. I can tell you most people don't do that. You know, I can tell you that I just finally started getting more scientific about farm accounting. And I just somewhat recently started keeping a notebook of like one specific property that I farm. There's like four fields there. Just that property has its own notebook. And so now I know that if I actually drive my equipment there and do some kind of task, I know that it cost me, you know, however much money in fuel that day. I know that I had to buy, you know, just yeah, 30 bucks and, and odds and ends for the machine or whatever. And then I value something for the cost of maintaining, you know, whatever that specific piece of equipment was for doing that task. So that way I at least know somewhat what I'm spending on this stuff. Most farmers don't do that. For a long time, I didn't do that. And I realized that's, uh, that's not good because you don't really know what you're doing, like what's even worth farming and what isn't. Because in the world of hay farming, at least, you can have two, two properties, and on one of them, when it's all said and done, you make twice as much per acre versus the other one. And the places look, they look pretty similar, you know, but one, let's say for example, is better drained, so there's less water related losses. From all the fucking water that won't fuck off. All right, so you get a better yield off that one because the nutrients don't get washed out of the soil, so that's good. And then a different property will be further away, so even though it yields a little more, it costs a lot more to go out there, especially like five times every time you cut hay with all the equipment. So even though it yields a little more, it's, you know, it's not as worthwhile. A simple notebook that costs like $2 at the store is more accounting than most farmers do. I think, and obviously not just for farmers, for people of our kinfolk as a whole who are like tradesmen or whatever, even just keeping track of stuff like that in a notebook would be a massive step in the right direction. Because if you do that, you will actually be able to know, you know, I've, you know, I've been doing this thing for a while, I've been working at this gig, I've been doing this thing for a guy or whatever, and I actually spent exactly this much money and I got this much out of it. And if there's situations where prices for doing whatever that thing is haven't really moved in the last five or 10 years, but you know, your costs have gone up, at least that way you know that you're in a position where you either need to renegotiate that or just not do it. You know, just spend your time on something else. There's no value in, in just working all the time to not have any increase. So many people, like, that's all they want to do. All they want to do is work. Okay, I don't want to work. I want to have an honest increase for working. That, that's different. Those things look the same, okay, but they're very, very different. A lot of people don't understand that. I don't think that working you know, 60 hours a week or something is a virtue or a good thing, but working 60 hours a week for a good increase is. And it really needs to be more of an increase than you get, you know, if you only worked 40 hours a week or whatever. All these stupid people, you know, like they want to have a good work ethic, but they only want to have the physical side of that and not the, you know, somewhat intellectual side. 
you know, our kind has spent the last 70 years working twice as much and they have even less to show for it now. So clearly just working more is not the answer. Our telegram crew knows a thing or two about what the answer is, but I can tell you it's not just working all the time. In a nutshell, I'll say that people need to be a lot more strategic about the quantity of work that they do, even more so than about the type of work that they do. They need to understand that a lot of things which might have been profitable 50 years ago no longer are. They need to pick and choose what they're really trying to do a lot more. They need to pick and choose the opportunities that they take a lot more. Give you a real life example of that is stacking small square bales on wagons. When I was a teenager, that was a gig that paid seven or eight bucks an hour cash, which was nice, but still seven or eight bucks an hour was fuck all even back then, especially for standing outside. You know, it's 100 degrees or standing up in a hayloft when it's like 120 in there and, and no air circulation. But that's what it paid, and surprisingly, nobody wanted to do it. All these farmers, they were offering that much, and it's not like this wasn't profitable for them. Okay, the price per pound for hay on, on small squares is like two to five times, depending on the market and the quality, what it's worth per pound, you know, in a round bale or something. So it's not like they didn't have, but you know, on, you know, to put it bluntly, they were being stingy, and they just didn't want to pay what it was worth even back then for people to work that hard and for that long under those conditions. So you know what? Nobody wanted to do it. And today I see ads and I'm not even looking for that kind of gig because I mean, it'd be great, but I kind of have my own stuff to take care of now. I see ads online on classified services for people who want manual labor to stack wagons and, and they're paying like 25 or 30 or 35 bucks an hour cash. Yeah, that's worth doing. Yeah, that's substantially more than you could make, you know, working at the gas station, or, you know, the sandwich shop or whatever for someone who doesn't have skills. That's substantially more than you can make in a place like that, and it's cash. And now they can kind of sort of find some level of help. But the main issue with that is now no longer the fact that it doesn't pay anything that's worth doing, which now it overall does. The main issue with that is that our people's birth rate has been negative for like 50 years at this point. Because they don't want to follow the word of God and be fruitful and multiply. They want to do what all the worldly people do and not have kids. So now the labor pool for a lot of kinds of farm work in small town areas is just non-existent because it was never born. So that's not the perfect example because it's like a two-factor issue. But especially, what, 10 or 15 years ago, that situation had not gotten to the point where it's at now. And back then it was mainly a financial issue. But still, you know, that serves the overall point of this message that some things are worth doing and some things aren't. The people who were selling small squares for like nine and $15 each at the farmer's markets and the horse places or whatever, well now, they either have to shell out and pay people a worthwhile amount for standing on hay wagons when it's 110 degrees, or they have to shell out, you know, five or six digits in equipment to get, you know, the mechanized version of that. But either way, for someone who's looking for work, stacking wagons actually pays a worthwhile amount now, which is nice. You know, if, if farmers who raise chickens, you know, if all these homesteaders and these small farmers trying to make money off of raising chickens would stop selling eggs for $2.50 a dozen, then soon people would start paying what that needs to cost to be profitable also. And I talk to people sometimes who raise cows, for example, and, and they complain that, you know, once everything's said and done, this is barely even profitable. Okay, so why do you do it? Why don't you just not do it then? Why are you investing all of your free time into taking care of these stupid things? You know, why are you investing all your time into taking care of these stupid things and all your disposable income into buying things for them if, they, if they're barely even covering their own cut? Why? And what's even worse is a lot of people who raise livestock don't even know how much money they're losing by doing it. You know, some people who raise cows, for example, are, are actually starting to get good about this. They actually found out that wherever they live, it, it, it really wouldn't be that difficult 
for them to sell, you know, ground beef direct from the farm or whatever in an above board legal manner. So now that's what they do. They're able to sell it cheaper than the stores for a higher quality product and have more money at the end of the day for doing that. I'm gonna throw this in here for free. One of the worst habits that farmers have is they just won't stop buying shit. Okay, now sometimes you just have to spend money to get things done. You know, like I got this broken cast iron piece here. I have to spend money to get another one. You know, like the tire situation we just talked about, I have one kind of usable tire and I, st I still don't even have a second. Okay, I, I have to buy that. And it's not worth paying two thirds as much for tire with a quarter its life expectancy in it, especially when you figure the time it takes to dick with the thing and actually get it mounted on the, on the machine in the first place. Okay, so sometimes you just have to spend money, but let me tell you, farmers buy a lot of stupid shit. I mean, a lot of stupid shit. A lot of smaller farmers look fondly back on the days when everything got done, you know, with a farm all H and an old half ton pickup, but they don't want to live like that. You know, they, they want to buy the cool, they want to buy the $70,000 dude bro truck. I don't even know if you can get one of those for $70,000 anymore. It's probably more now, but they want to buy the, the big boy dude bro truck and then justify it as a farm expense when they know they could do as much as they're doing without it. You know, that's like $800 or $1,200 a month right there. Sometimes people ask why I don't have a UTV, you know, like one of those you know, four by four little deals in any of my videos. The reason why is because they cost more than a good used pickup even now. And I would like to get, you know, like a cheap beater ATV or whatever. I look at listings for them sometimes. Who knows when I'll actually ever have time to dick with it though and actually have time to do that, but still. Some people have like, you know, an old Honda four tracks or whatever, but I can tell you a lot of people don't. A lot of people spend 30 or $50,000, you know, on the, on the super duper meme machines, which again is great if you want to do that. But if you're trying to justify that as a business expense and then wonder why you're not making money at the end of the month, now you got problems. You know, I'm not trying to pick on livestock raising guys, but I see them purchase just the most ridiculous of shit. I have seen them spend thousands of dollars on temporary fencing so they can temporarily fence, fence in their pasture, which has the equivalent of like $30 worth of hay in it. Okay, that's not sustainable. A lot of people say, well, you don't understand. We need this and we need that and so forth. What I understand is the people raised livestock for thousands of years without any of this crap. You know, another example of that is one of these rims on the Simplement I'm working on. You know, I got the thing, it's unsurprisingly, the rim has rust damage. It's rusted through in a couple places on one side. And um, I was thinking, I was like, well, you know, I could just weld this. But then I remembered that I actually did that before. And uh, I learned welding even off road. You don't want to weld like on road wheels. There's too much liability, but even off road stuff, it's not worth dicking with. Okay, because I've done that. If you're actually gonna take the time to find another rim and then like cut a good part out of it and cleanly cut yours and then fit the two pieces together, remove all the scale and everything, actually weld it, sand down all the weld so it doesn't rub through the tube. If you're gonna actually do that, it's easily a half day project to do it right and to do it cleanly. I checked online, I can buy this rim for like 68 bucks right now. Actually, I misspoke. I did the ugly farmer thing. It's a half a day project plus overhead. Plus welding wire, which is more than doubled. Plus shielding gas, if you can even find a place that's still functional enough to sell shielding gas, which gets harder to do every year. All that and all that time and energy, and really it's not to avoid spending $68 on a new one because then you have this fabric cobbled thing that's not worth as much as a new one. There's just not a way to weld off-road rims in such a manner where they turn out looking half decent. It's probably not gonna last as long as a new one. So half a day of work plus all that overhead to save like 30 or $40. Yeah, let me tell you, that wheel's in the scrap dumpster right now and I'm about to go order a new one here 
in a few minutes. In summary, I would say, especially to people who are just getting into homesteading stuff, buy a stupid notebook and keep track of what you're spending versus what you're getting. And in the economy of the clown world, you, you really can't assume anything. So you really have to keep track of what you're putting into things and what you're getting out of things. And it might not be what you expect. So be careful and don't just do what our people have done for 70 years and work and work and work all the time to somehow have less. Let me tell you about something that drives me crazy when I see it. And that is when farmers buy hay and they just leave it outside in rows, usually of round bales, and it just sits there and rots. I have done that in situations where for one reason or another, you know, it didn't sell the season before. I really hate to do it, okay? But you know, in fairness, I don't wanna be a hypocrite here. I gotta tell you, I've done it, but I try really hard not to. And the reason why is because I understand how destructive that is to the product and how expensive it is. Uh, but you know, I, I, let me tell you, that's what most people do. Most people don't think anything about it. You know, I was talking to a farmer like just two days ago. This guy is one of the smart ones. This guy is one of the ones who's actually put pencil to paper. And what he does is he does what's called line wrapping with his hay. That's where, you know, he makes round bales. He pays someone to come out with this wrapper, with this wrapping machine. And they set the bales on that, they get coated in plastic. So then they can sit outside, because this guy has like 300 cows or something. Because this guy has like 300 head of cattle or something, he doesn't have a barn big enough for all that hay. So, but this way, because they're wrapped in plastic, they don't spoil, they don't get rained on and rot for 11 months out of the year before he needs them. So, you know, we were talking about this, and like I said, this guy is doing things in an intelligent manner. He said, in essence, it's not so much whether they can afford to have them wrapped, it's whether they can afford not to, and they can't. Okay, because I've moved round bales that have sat out for 11 months, and at least a third of them is spoiled. And because of how circles work, most of the mass is in that outer third. And it's disgusting. I, I know that's what everybody wants to buy. I know that's what everybody wants to feed their animals because, quote, unquote, it's cheaper. Really, it isn't. We'll talk about that. I am a hay producer. I like to produce hay and sell it. Um, but I can tell you if I had animals, I would 100% not be leaving round bales outside. I understand if you live in the high desert, if you live in Wyoming or something where, where there's only like 10 inches of rain all year, that's one thing, it's not that big of a deal. But where we are, the water is just so destructive. It just absolutely rots at least a third of the bale. And talking to this guy, he understands that. You know, let's do some quick math here. Right now, four by five round bales of just average mixed grass hay are about 50 bucks. So you figure you have 40% of that, which just rots into nothing. That's a value of about, let's say 20 bucks to keep the math simple that you lose per round bale. And we're not even gonna talk about how the fact that the part that doesn't rot still degrades in quality greatly. We'll just leave that out to make this even simpler. But even with that 40% you lose, that's like 20 bucks per bale that you lose. Okay, this guy, you know, I didn't ask this guy specifically, but the last time I was in a discussion about what line wrapping costs, it's about eight bucks a bale from what I was told. That's not a service I offer, so I don't really know. But you know, that's eight bucks a bale. So this guy, assuming he's spending what those people were charging, he's spending eight bucks, but he's gaining $12. Okay, that would be an example of a good investment. And really, he's gaining a lot more than that because if he was going to have 40% of his hay crop spoil just out there sitting in the pasture like all these people do, if he was going to have 40% of his crop spoil, then that means he'd need to cover 40% more acres to have the same amount of usable feed. That means he would have to run his equipment 40% more hours for maintenance. That means he would have to spend 40% more on fuel. That means his cost of labor would be 40% higher. But this guy's smart. He doesn't work 40% more for the same amount of product. He works 40% less than a lot of other people do, and he has more to show for it. You know, I always recommend that people do whatever it takes to keep hay out of the weather. Okay, some relatives of mine actually do have enough barn space 
for their bales. And, you know, I can tell you, we've taken hay out of that barn a full year after it's put in, making way for the new stuff, and it is immaculate. It looks like it was just put in an hour before. There is 0% spoilage. Most people are not going to have the barn space, but usually what's cheapest is if they will have like a, a gravel pad put down so there's no mud, so the bales aren't sitting in mud. And then they just put them there, ideally on like some old tires or like some old pallets or something to keep them off the surface of the ground. And then cover that with a tarp, like a lot of people like those used billboard tarps. Last time I bought one of those, it was like 120 bucks delivered, which was stupid cheap. But you know, that's, that's a great example. A lot of people run around every hay season, they run around like chickens with their heads cut off. Just trying to work all the time, running themselves ragged, racking up the hours on their equipment. If you thought through this a little more, you could work 40% less for the, for the same outcome, which really isn't linear. Because like I said, it's, you work 40% less for the same value of feed, but it's not linear because you, know, you have less maintenance costs and everything, so that value of feed costs you less per unit in that regard. But a lot of people don't think about this. You know, they just, they just view working for the sake of working as some kind of positive thing. Like, oh, I'll just work hard and put up 40% more. Why don't you work less, but work more strategically and plan this out better? Then, you know, the other thing, that guy handles 40% less bales. It's 40% less trips out to where his haylot is. You know, even, even that adds up. Even that's a cost savings to figure in. You know, a lot of this stuff really isn't all that complicated. You just have to actually sit down and think about it. And a lot of people just don't bother to. That's the issue. That's the kind of thing you can't do. You have to be like the, the farmer who line wraps his stuff. You got to do that or something equivalent. Otherwise, you can take your feed budget. You know, let's say you, you raise cows, you're going to spend 20000 on hay. You know, that's like $8,000 gone. You know, farming doesn't pay enough to where you can just essentially dispose of $8,000 out there rotting in your pasture. You know, and I don't say this stuff to knock farmers. They're some of the only functional nation-building people among our kinfolk. I'm trying to help you guys. You know, you work so hard, I want to see you actually get something for the work you do. But you know, another thing in this regard, I was talking to someone recently about how you don't really see people with parts cars today like you did, you know, even 20 years ago. This is another lesson in profitability and in deciding what's worthwhile and what isn't. You know, I re I'm not that old, but even I remember when it was a lot more common than it is today for someone who had like, you know, a farm truck or a work truck or something to have another one just like it that was maybe rusted out or perhaps had been crashed or something, sitting, parked behind the barn, so they could go take parts off it, you know, when they're when the good one broke. You do not see that very often today. And the reason why is because the availability of cheap parts bought online and shipped to your door in like two or three days really killed the incentive for that. And then, you know, this is a good thing. This is a good example of something to talk about here for what's worth doing and what's not. Let's think about this. All right, if you got a farm truck and you have a parts truck for it, you know, parked back in the pasture or wherever, it's just sitting there. Let's say that your truck breaks. Let's say it needs a sensor, okay? You have to actually take the time to gather up all your tools. You have to put them in, you know, some other vehicle, put them in a bucket of a tractor or whatever, and drive out there. That costs you money. Not much, but that's still some fuel and still some maintenance on your equipment. Okay, you have to actually gather all this stuff up. You have to actually go out there. Then you have to start taking things apart, you know, taking covers off of things, moving other parts that are in the way. Then you have your sensor. Well, let's think about this. In a lot of situations, a guy would be hard pressed to do that entire, that entire process of actually going and, and, and retrieving that thing and then bringing all the tools back and putting them away and whatnot. You'd be hard pressed to do that in less than two or three hours, depending on the complexity of the part. Well, you know, if that's, you know, some sensor that you can buy right now on the internet, brand new, shipped to your door for 34 bucks, that is not worth salvaging. 
you know, and that assumes that the one you salvage is worth that 34 bucks, which it isn't, you know, because it's used. It's like 20 years old. Do you even know if it works? Did the, are you going to do all this and go all the way out there just to find that the, the, you know, that the mice chewed the wires or that it got damaged somehow? It's not even usable. That's a great example of something that's not worth doing. Now, sometimes that can be worthwhile, okay? If you need, like, if you want to take your chances on a salvage engine or something, okay, that's one thing. But for smaller stuff, it, to put it bluntly, it's not worthwhile. You know, even if that sensor is five bucks at the junkyard, you know, you got to figure it's like 40 minutes there, 40 minutes back, at least an hour walking through the place and waiting in line behind the crackheads and everything. You know, that's like, what, two and a half hours of your life approximately, plus gas for the sensor that's worth, if it works, half of 34 bucks. You know, you're making like six bucks an hour doing that. Not worth it.